Okay, thank you very much. Well, it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be back in Boulder. So uh, I think I did this once uh, 11 years ago, and I had fun then, so I expect I'll have fun now. So, um, okay, so, um, so I was asked to uh, talk about topological insulators, and um, so I th thought I would broaden that a little bit to topological band theory in general. So let me just uh, give you a little bit of an outline of, of where I'm going to go over the course of the four lectures. So, um, so I'm going to start off with some uh, sort, of, um, sort of general things about topology and band theory, so topological band theory. And then, um, and then that'll uh, segue into a discussion of the time reversal invariant topological insulator, so the Z2. OK, in two, three dimensions, um, uh, plus some generalizations. And then. Um, uh, um, then uh, uh, I'm going to give a discussion of topological superconductivity, which one can sort of understand in a similar language. And I think maybe that'll be something that you're going to see um, over again. But um, I think it's nice to sort of see how the language of topological band theory that I'll be developing sort of um, kind of you know uh, d describes these things in a unified way. So um, okay, and plus generalizations. Okay, so um, so this is the plan, um, and uh, so uh, I think what I'll do is start by um, uh, so 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 one thing I'll say is that um, uh, you know the, one thing that's really been new over the last uh, decade has been the appreciation of the interplay between topology, which we heard a little bit about this morning, and also symmetry. Okay, and so so symmetry of course, is one of the most familiar things that we learn about in physics. You know, uh, you know, if you have a circle, you can do things to it. You can rotate it, or you can reflect it, and it kind of looks the same, right? And so understanding what you can do to a system that keeps it the same um, is a very powerful conceptual tool that allows you to simplify problems. It allows you to understand conservation laws. Um, and also, as we discussed, uh, this morning, um, it's a classification tool for classifying phases of matter. Okay, um, in particular, if you can just uh, understand what symmetries a phase of matter breaks. So, for instance, if this is a uh, uh, you know the uh, order parameter of a magnet, then then it breaks a some rotational symmetry. Um, then that's a, a classification tool for. Um, uh, for classifying phases of matter, okay, um, uh, um, and there are many many kinds of symmetries. There's you know um, there are um, you know uh, uh, crystalline symmetries, translation symmetries, um, discrete translation symmetries, rotational symmetries. There's gauge symmetry. There's many kinds of symmetries that are um, very uh, powerful to uh, think about. Um, so uh, an equally powerful tool, though is uh, topology. Um, and uh, so what topology uh, is about, of course, is, um, is you know, what is it that stays the same when you deform something, OK? Um, and so the classic, uh, classic example of that is if you, if you look, what's the difference between a sphere and a, um, and a, a donut, OK? So, um, uh, um, so a sphere has a genus 0. Whereas a donut has a, um, a torus, has uh, a genus one, which is basically counting the number of holes. And so what topology is about is it's how do you tell the difference between these kinds of things. And so, so you can smoothly deform a sphere into a pancake, um, and, nothing, and, and nothing drastic happens along the way. But you can't change it into a donut without poking a hole in it. Okay? And so, um, so, um, so how do you describe this? So, um, uh, so let me just give you a, a, um, 
uh, a very simple um, example of how you might uh, think about this. How could you, you know, let's suppose you were living on the surface of this uh, donut. How could you tell it was actually a donut and not a sphere? And um, so uh, there's a, um, a, a very famous and beautiful theorem called the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. Which, um, which says that uh, if, you, if you have some surface and you integrate over the surface the uh, Gaussian curvature, and so what the Gaussian tur curvature is, is it's basically um, uh, you have radi radii of curvature in two perpendicular directions, so it's the product of the uh, radii of curvature. That's what the Gaussian curvature is. If you integrate that over the, over the surface, then you're guaranteed that you get a quantized answer that's quantized in units of 4 pi. And, uh, and the uh, integer multiple of 4 pi tells you what the genus is. Okay? And so this is actually, for a sphere, this is easy. You can do this in your head, right? Because um, the uh, Gaussian curvature is just 1 over the radius of the sphere squared which when you integrate over uh, the sphere just gives you 4 pi. Okay? Um, and for the torus, maybe it's not too hard to see that the torus, you can basically think of it as being flat. Um, so its Gaussian curvature is 0. Um, uh, so you get, uh, you get 0. Okay? So you can sort of understand um, those uh, two cases. And so, um, so, uh, so this is an example um, of a topological invariant. Okay, and, um, and so, you know, one of the things that we're going to develop is how we can develop similar kinds of mathematical descriptions um, uh, to describe quantum states of matter. Okay, um, so, so, uh, so for topological phases of matter, So what one needs, so, so in topology, what one's concerned with is sort of, um, you know, what things stay the same under smooth deformations, okay? And so we need some notion of a smooth deformation for, um, for, uh, for, for describing uh, uh, states of matter. And so the, um, the uh, idea uh, that I want to suggest is that I can uh, think of um, topological equivalence Um, as arising from uh, adiabatic continuity. So, um, and so what this requires, so the adiabatic principle in quantum mechanics tells you that if you have a quantum state that, um, that uh, is separated in, in, by, in, in, from all other quantum states uh, by, um, by a finite energy, then that energy difference defines a time scale over which you can smoothly change your Hamiltonian very slowly so that you, you're guaranteed to stay in the same, same state the whole time. You don't induce any transitions if you go slow enough. Okay, and so this is the adiabatic principle. And so, so you can use this adiabatic principle if you have an energy gap so if you imagine now I have some deformation, and I have, um, I have quantum states where, uh, you know, uh, so I have a ground state and excited states, OK? Um, and uh, so, so um, if, I, if, if I have an energy gap, then I can smoothly, slowly deform this slow enough so I'm guaranteed to stay in the same state. And so in that sense, um, I'm staying in the same phase. Okay? And so this idea of a phase of matter is really um, uh, uh, something that is topologically equivalent. Okay? And so that's, that's what we want to say. And so now, of course, um, uh, the, uh, the, the question that this immediately poses, if we have this notion of topological equivalence for phases of matter, the question is, is are there any, any uh, uh, non-trivial phases? Okay? And so, so what would have to happen in that case is in order to get to a non-trivial phase, one would have to go through some uh, quantum critical point um, where, uh, 
where the energy gap um, uh, goes to a zero. Okay, and so um, okay, and um, so uh, so what we want to do, you know, so our goal here is. Um, we would like to be able to classify and characterize, um, you know, the kinds, the different kinds of, um, of 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 phases that you can have. Okay, um, and uh, and I want to add to that um, uh, with or without symmetries. Okay, and so so one can refine this notion of a um, adiabatic deformation to be one which preserves certain symmetries. Okay, and so that's going to play a, 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 a key role, for instance, when we talk about the uh, Z2 topological insulators. Yes, question? It could be, yeah, absolutely, sure, sure, absolutely, yeah. No, yeah. Um, uh, so my only, my only point is, is that to get from one state to one that is topologically Distinct, you can't go. You have to go through something, some through some through some critical point. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, um, so we'd like to be able to classify all phases of matter with, uh, you know, with or without symmetries. Um, but of course, um, uh, you know, that is a uh, incredibly hard problem. Okay, one which um, I, I don't think we um, uh, still have a complete solution uh, of. Okay, and um, uh, you know because uh, to classify phases of matter, one's really confronted with the many-body problem. Okay, and the many-body problem is hard. Okay, it's also interesting. So there are many interesting things that one can learn, and you know, you know, th some of the things that we learned about the, this morning are examples of of of, of interesting many-body uh, problems. But um, uh, um, uh, the approach that I want to take is um, uh, I want to uh, uh, try to simplify things into a more manageable uh, set of problems. And so, um, so rather than think about the the general problem of trying to classify all possible. Um, uh, uh, you know, electronic or quantum phases um, of matter. What I want to do is I want to uh, uh, classify and characterize what I will call single particle topological phases. So these are, say, topological electronic phases that um, uh, can be described using uh, non-interacting fermions. Okay. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that the only problem I'm interested in is the non-interacting fermion problem. Okay. Um, uh, the problem I'm interested in is problems in which the sort of mean field theory of the interactions, Hartree-Fock theory, gets it right. Okay, and and so there's a wide class of interacting uh, quantum systems whose ground states are adiabatically connected to the ground state of non-interacting fermions. Okay, and so those are the um, the ground states that it's a manageable goal to try to um, to try to 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 uh, characterize. Okay, and so that's um, that's uh, what I want to do, and so I want to emphasize that. Um, you know, uh, uh, this theory doesn't become wrong when you have interactions. Um, but um, so it's just that um, you know we're describing phases which are which have interactions, but the interactions are not so big that you've gone into some other phase. Okay. Okay. And um, now, uh, um, so one further. Uh, simplification that I'm going to um, to uh, take advantage of um, uh, is um, is symmetry, 
okay? Um, and in particular, um, translation symmetry. Um, uh, Okay, now this is not an essential thing. So one can, there's, there's, there's much to be said about um, uh, even, the non, e even the single particle topological phases, you know, when you allow disorder and you allow sym uh, translation symmetry to be violated. Um, but um, uh, uh, things are particularly um, uh, uh, simple if we, um, if we uh, believe in uh, uh, translation symmetry so that we're talking about uh, crystalline matter. Okay, and, um, and so this um, then is the subject of the band theory of solids. And so this, what, this is what leads to um, what, I'll, what I call topological band theory. Okay, and um, so I just want to, you know, pause here. You know, band theory, of course, everybody learns about band theory and, you know, from the sort of first solid state physics course uh, that you take, and it's it seems kind of uh, you know a little bit old school, right? Um, and I just want to you know it's it's um, uh, uh, it's it's useful to to sort of step back and and sort of appreciate how consequential a theory that is. Okay, so band theory when it works, when it works, it doesn't always work, but when it works, band theory works really well. Okay, um, and uh, and it allows. Um, for um, uh, a, um, a, a quite detailed um, uh, understanding of actual real materials, okay? And, and so, and it's that understanding of real materials, of course, that's responsible for, uh, you know, the fact that you have uh, uh, a powerful computer in your pocket, okay? So, um, uh, so, so, so band theory is a consequential theory, and uh, so, um, we want to uh, uh, understand the consequences of topology in that context. Okay, so um, so let me sort of start by just reminding you about band theory. Okay, and I'll do this quickly. Um, so uh, so first of all, in band theory, again, we've um, by uh, by, by uh, uh, taking away the interactions, we allow ourselves to solve the many-body problem by solving many single-particle quantum mechanics problems. Okay, and, and so, so, um, so we solve a single-particle Schrodinger equation. We have some single-particle Hamiltonian, um, which, uh, which commutes with translations. So translate. So so T of R is a uh, translation by a lattice vector R. Okay, and if this is the case, then you know that you can choose your eigenstates to be eigenstates of the translation. So that means that I can I can I can write uh, uh, my my states. I can label my states with a momentum. Like that. Okay, or alternatively, what I can do is I can define um, block states which are periodic in the unit cell. So what I can define is I can define this uh, state psi k as e to the i k dot r, where this r now is sort of is the position operator, okay, um, times a... Uh, times a uh, block state where this block state is, is, is periodic. And so the, 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 so, so the point is that this state, all of the information in this state is contained within a single unit cell of the crystal. And so, um, so this you can solve by solving a much smaller problem than, uh, than this. Okay? And so this is one of the power, you know, taking, taking advantage of the power of uh, translation symmetry. And so, so this U then will be an eigenstate of the block Hamiltonian. Which... Um, which is uh, which is basically um, uh, uh, 
do I have my, I want to have plus and minus. Okay, so, uh, so the point is um, that uh, uh, by doing this block, uh, you know, decomposition, one uh, ends up with a single particle problem, which is now parameterized by the momentum. Okay, and, um, and you know, K, of course, uh, is in the uh, Broan zone, which uh, is a, um, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, is defined periodically. It has it's it's a it's a torus in d dimension. So in one dimension, the Bro one zone is a circle. In two dimension, it's it's a torus. Okay. So so this then um, leads to a uh, band structure. And I can think of the band structure as basically being h of k. And H of K has a set of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Um, and so, uh, so if I plot the, uh, you know, so I'm going to have a set of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, if there's a gap, Separating the valence band and the conduction band, then one has then one has um, uh, this uh, gap separating the ground state from the excited states. Okay, and so um, so what we now so so this goal of classifying topological band structures is then becomes the goal of of you know um, classifying band structures that have a gap that separates the uh, conduction band and the valence band. Okay. Okay. Now, so there's something important here, which is by going to this block uh, formulation, uh, uh, we ended up now where we're classifying a Hamiltonian, which is now parameterized by a set of parameters. Okay, and whenever you have a Hamiltonian that is parameterized by a set of parameters, then um, that invites one to um, to uh, think about a very powerful conceptual tool, which is the Berry phase. Okay, and so uh, let me uh, introduce the Berry phase. You see, the Berry phase arises whenever you have um, a, uh, a system that has uh, a parameter. Okay? And the reason it arises is because the wave function in quantum mechanics has an intrinsic ambiguity to it. Okay? In, uh, the, the phase of the wave function in, is ambiguous. And what that means is that uh, if I have um, an eigenvector u of k, then an equally good eigenvector is one in which the phase um, is modified by, um, in which the phase is, is changed. And this uh, change in the phase could very well be um, dependent on the parameter. Okay, and um, so, uh, so this transformation having a, uh, this, this, this uh, parameter dependent uh, change of the phase, Reminds you of an electromagnetic gauge transformation. Okay, it's the same sort of story. And you know, when you when you have um, you know uh, the vector potential, and and you know, uh, uh, and you do a gauge transformation, you change the vector potential. Okay, um, it's the same here. The only difference is is that instead of having um, uh, instead of uh, living in real space, um, this um, this uh, this gauge transformation is changing. In uh, momentum space, or whatever the space of parameters that you have. Yes. Oh, I, I mean, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. So, um, 
Yeah. So, uh, and so what this invites us to do is to, um, uh, is to define the analog of the vector potential. Okay. And so that's the Berry connection. which I'll call A the same letter as we call the vector potential. Okay, And um, so it's pretty easy to see that if I do this, um, this uh, uh, change in the phase, then um, the Berry connection transforms in exactly the same kind of way as the electromagnetic uh, uh, vector potential. So in particular, under this uh, gauge transformation, um, so, uh, so UK, the, the, der the der derivative with respect to K is going to pick up a term here, which gives us A, but then we're also going to pick up a gradient of phi K. And so, um, so A is going to go to A plus the gradient of this, of this phase. Okay, and so um, so of course a by itself is not gauge in, uh, gauge invariant. It depends on on this uh, this uh, arbitrary phase. Um, but uh, what is interesting, just like in the in in um, in electromagnetism, you know, the vector potential by itself doesn't have an ha have an independent meaning, but the magnetic field, which is the curl of the vector potential, does. Okay, and so um, so uh, so this uh, 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 invites us to define the Berry phase, which is the analog of the magnetic flux. So um, so that's so if I have any um, uh, for any closed loop. Let me call it C. Then uh, so so uh, so let's suppose I have so this is C. Then uh, what I can define is I can define the line integral of the uh, Berry connection, and uh, uh, that is guaranteed to be gauge invariant. Okay. Um, so this is over C, okay? And I could equally well write that. I could use Stokes' theorem, basically, to, uh, to write uh, that uh, you know, integral of A around the boundary um, uh, as an integral of the analog of the magnetic field where F is essentially the curl of A is the uh, Berry curvature. I know. I'll get to that. Yeah. Nick is right. See, it, it is contractible. If the Hamiltonian is short ranged, okay. So, um, so, and and that I think is an implicit assumption that I'm making that that um, that the Hamiltonian is a local operator that doesn't have long, long range pieces. Then uh, H of k is essentially the Fourier transform of H of R. So, if it's short range, it's not going to have it's not going to have singular uh, behavior. Yeah. yeah, but that's an important point. Which is that um, uh, uh, the, the the principle of locality is an essential um, uh, is, is essential for thinking about these topological uh, so uh, is it considerations. Just a transform where you just need exponential fall off. That's uh, Certainly, exponential is good enough, um, and when one could ask whether you could maybe have it be a little bit less than that. So so, um, and I don't know the I don't know the exact what the exact requirement for how short range short range has to be. Um, yeah. 
but certainly uh, certainly exponential is 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 good enough. Well, I want to say that h of k is continuous. Okay, and if h of k is continuous, then the spectrum uh, I expect will be continuous as well. That's right. Is that uh, is that is that what? Well, that's, there's various versions of this. Okay. But you may not want to hear. Probably not. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so so this is an important concept and there's a very important example. Okay? Um and this is the most important uh example. So um and uh it's nice and simple. It's the two-level system. Okay, so uh, so let's suppose that uh, we just have uh, two states. So our Hamiltonian then is going to be a two by two matrix, parameterized by k. Now any two by two matrix, um, you know, you can write. Uh, in terms of the uh, Pauli matrices, so I can write this. Well, let me let me write it like this. Okay. Alternatively, I could write this as. Uh, D0 plus DZ, DX minus I, DY. Okay. You're talking about lattices, not the two levels. Yeah, or so I'm talking about a block Hamiltonian, which is. Uh, uh, which is, you, you see, I mean, look, the, the, the concept of, of Baric phase is much is more general than band theory. <laughs> it applies to any system where you have um, a quantum system which is parameterized by some set of parameters. And so I'm saying I have a two-level system which is parameterized by K. Okay? And no, you're right that if I, if, as a band theory, that's a, it's a two-band model. Okay, so it's a, it's it's a model where where maybe I just have two orbitals per unit cell. Okay, and so um, so then that'll be described by a two-band Hamiltonian. But but um, but uh, uh, the Berry phase, in a sense, it's more general than than that. Okay, it can it can describe a spin, for example. Okay, and uh, yeah. Sure. I mean, but uh, I, I'm not sure what you mean by insulator. But um, there's a gap. Well, right. But yeah. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I mean, this is like the Hamiltonian of a spin in a in a magnetic field. You know. So this piece just ju is just a constant piece. It doesn't change the. It just changes the overall. You know, it's zero in energy, um, but this is like a magnetic field that couples to the spin. Which, um, and so what we know, so, so you can just read off what the you know the eigenstates of of, of this. They're gonna there's gonna be two, and uh, and you know that they're gonna be. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry, I should put d zero in there. Okay, and um, so so if we pick one of the eigenstates, then you know the eigenvector only depends on the uh, direction. Okay, 
And so one can ask the question now, if we take k through some closed loop, we can ask what the Berry phase is. Okay, And um, what we know is that since the state only depends on the direction um, that this d vector uh, points in, it only depends on the direction of the magnetic field, then, um, then uh, the Berry phase is only going to depend on the trajectory that the direction of d sweeps out on the unit sphere. Okay, and in fact, the answer is very simple. So let's imagine that we have, so here's the, here's the unit sphere where I have, you know, um, where this is d. Um, so if the, uh, if the, um, if d of k sweeps out, you know, a loop, sweeps out a, um, uh, uh, a curve on the unit sphere, then um, the famous result is that the Berry phase is equal to one half of the solid angle swept out by D. Okay. And so, uh, so, so this is an important result. If, if, if you haven't been through this, then uh, this is a good exercise to, uh, to, to make sure you know how to do. Okay, this is, this is basic. This is, you know, um, a basic thing. And so, so an example of this is um, what I always like to refer to as my favorite minus sign. So if you have a, you know, if, if you have a spin and you rotate it by 2 pi, so you just rotate it um, uh, by 2 pi, then, um, then the angle on the sphere, the solid angle on the sphere that you sweep out is half of the sphere, which is 2 pi. And so the Berry phase that you get is pi. And so that's the minus sign that a spin picks up uh, when you rotate by 2 pi, which we already talked about a little bit this morning. OK. OK. Not yet. So you have to conclude that there is some. I will. I, I haven't gotten there yet. I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. So so th it's a very fair question to ask. What does this have to do with band theory? So 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 what I hope I've convinced you is that one can define a Berry phase in band theory. So the interesting question is is what does it mean? Okay, and I will answer that. <coughs> and uh, in order to answer that, um, I want to answer it in the simplest context, um, which is uh, one dimension. Pardon me? Which idea? Barry, well, so actually, so other people in the room probably know the history. I mean, so Barry, it goes to back well before Barry, I believe. Um, and I don't know how far back it goes. Do you know, Nick? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the context, so for what I'm about to tell you, um, it, you know, applying this Barry phase to, to band theory, that was more, I think, in the 19, um, 1990s, I believe, 19, late 80s, 1990s. Oh, no, absolutely. No, forget it. Yeah, that was 80s. If, Nick, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I don't know why, why I said that. Yeah, absolutely. Phallus. In fact, I will. Yeah. OK. Okay, and so what I want to describe, so the, so the punchline that I'm going to get to you is that the meaning of the Berry phase um, uh, is it is an electric polarization, okay? And um, so I want to tell you about the electric polarization in one dimension. Trans 
transporting something, apart from the dynamical phase, you pick up the Fermi phase. You, you just define the Fermi phase. But that's true. Maybe that's what Victor was getting. Yeah. The actual statement from Barry is connected to the Well, I, I agree with that, and but that's not what I'm going to be using. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll mention it tomorrow. Good. Okay. Okay. So. But Charlie, this electric polarization has nothing to do with this. It will. It will. It will. It will. Yeah. You'll see. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Okay, so so let me just remind you. Let, let's go back to uh, you know sophomore E and M, um, and uh, remember what polarization is. So you know if you have um, if you have uh, uh, you know uh, uh, electric dipoles, right? Um, you know then uh, if you have a if you have a density of electric dipoles. Then you have a polarization. So, so, so classically, P is equal to the dipole moment in one dimension per unit length. Okay. And um, so the thing you know, if you have if you have a bunch of uh, if you have a density of dipoles, then um, then you know, if the polarization is, is constant, there aren't any charges. All the charges cancel each other out. But, um, but you can have bound charges. And so, uh, so in the bulk, you can have a bound charge density, which is, you know, the, the divergence of P. And then at the end, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be a leftover plus charge at the end and minus charge at the other end. So I can call this uh, you know, Q end. And Q end is just going to be equal to you know, the polarization dotted into the, the normal of the end. OK? And so, you know, so lots of materials are polar. And they have they have these dipole moments, and so you can ask the question: In band theory, how do you actually compute what the um, what the polarization is? Okay, so how would you measure the you know what would you do to measure it? Well, you'd measure you just measure the, the the charge at the end. That's how that's how you could you know measure what the polarization is. But um, so the problem is is that uh, you know in band theory what you do you know in order to do you know you always put it on periodic boundary conditions. Right, so that you can define k, and so you don't have the end to be able to measure the uh, the end charge. Okay, and so so you can ask the question: Well, what is it? I have some band structure. What property of that band structure tells me what the electric polarization of that insulator is? Okay, and what I want to convince you of is that in fact um, it is uh, a Berry phase, and so. Um, so let me. So I'm going to give you a couple of arguments. Okay, and um, so what I want to argue to you is that the polarization is in fact the Berry phase evaluated around a loop, which is the entire Brillouin zone. So this Brillouin zone is in one dimension is a sphere. You know, so it's going, it's going from, uh, you know, so k is going from minus pi over a to pi over a, essentially, right? So it's going around the one-dimensional Brillouin zone where minus pi and pi are the same point. Okay, and of course, a is the usual.
primary connection. Okay. So I want to convince you that this is true. And so the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to first convince you, try to convince you that, that, uh, that this quantity kind of smells like the electric polarization. Okay, and then I'll give you a slightly more rigorous um, uh, argument. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. <coughs> okay. And so the the first argument that I want to give you that makes these shows that these kind of look like the same thing is I want to show you that they both share the same intrinsic ambiguity. Okay, so uh, so let's think about the um, uh, the polarization and the bulk. This 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 thing. So so if I'm going to measure it by measuring the charge at the end. Now the thing about it, you know, the the charge at the end is not completely determined by the bands, by the by the electronic structure of the bulk because you know if I uh, if I have my you know my one dimensional insulator with uh, you know, with um, uh, with a polarization, um, you know, so maybe it has some charge at the end. But who's who's to keep me from just uh, adding an electron at the end without changing anything in the bulk? That's just as good a end of this of this uh, as well. Okay, and so for that reason, um, uh, uh, this polarization can only be defined modulo the electric charge. Okay, so so uh, so so Q the the end charge is only equal to P mod E. Okay. Now, of course, so I can change the charge at the end by any integer number of electrons just by adding electrons. I can't change it by a fractional number of electrons because I don't have fractional electrons that I can add to it to the end. Okay. Without changing with, without changing the polarization. Okay. So the fractional part of the end charge is perfectly well defined, but the integer part of it is not. Okay. And um, so, uh, so this is um, of just an in, you know this is a feature of the classical you know just you know just of the of the polarization. So um, uh, so now what I want to uh, explain to you is that the Berry phase has exactly the same issue. Okay, and so um, so uh, so let's think about the Berry phase, how the Berry phase changes under a gauge transformation. Uh, pardon? Isn't a perfect termination well defined? Let's have a bulk you know, terminate. You can terminate in a perfect way. I, I don't have to add. But you could. I, I, I could, but there's a have all the time. No? Only if you're in the limit where you have atomic atomic um you know, so certainly, if, if 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 your insulator is built out built out of out of atoms that um, that you know are really inert atoms that are that, that keep where it's well defined which at which electron is living on which atom, then I think I can I can do that. But you see, the problem is 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 that in in, in a band structure, you don't um, you know you don't each electron doesn't have its own atom that it lives on. Okay, and and the ambiguity there then becomes the problem of um, you know uh, uh, you can't specify which atom each electron lives on, and so if you moved all the electrons over by one, you you can't tell that you did that, and if you moved all the electrons over by one atom, okay, then you'd you'd have an extra end charge at the end. 
Okay, and so so um, uh, I think it's only if you really um, uh, uh, are in a limit where where um, uh, each atom is not, you know, sharing electrons with the other atoms. You know, where you're not um, where you're really in the atomic limit. Okay, that 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 you can that that you can really that is really well defined. Now look, I mean, there's going to be a happiest end, you know, that has the minimal charge at the end. That that's certainly true. Okay. Pardon? Lowest energy. Lowest energy. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, so so what I want to uh, I want to return to this question <coughs> of how the Berry phase changes under a, a gate transformation. So again, I want to imagine my uh, I do a, some some k-dependent gauge transformation, and um, so uh, so uh, so let's ask how the Berry phase, which is the integral over the Brillouin zone of A, changes. Okay, and so uh, so that's going to go to uh, you know. Uh, what we had before, okay? But now, Nick, we have to be careful, right? Um, uh, because um, uh, um, uh, in what I was doing before, I implicitly assumed that this phase had to be single-valued, okay? Um, whereas when I'm going, you know, so and, and, and that was a reasonable assumption if this, um, uh, parameter space that I'm that my loop is living in is contractible, okay? Because um, because if 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 it's not single valued, if the phase, for instance, winds by two pi, if the loop is contractible, then there'd have to be a singularity somewhere in the middle, and so we ruled that out, okay? But the Brillouin zone is a little bit different because the Brillouin zone, um, uh, the Brillouin zone, up here. This loop is not the boundary of an interior, okay? And so there's nothing wrong with having the phase wind by 2 pi when I go around, and that defines a perfectly um, uh, smooth a gauge transformation, okay? And so, so now what we see is that under this um, uh, large gauge transformation, in which in which the phase difference when I go around the Brill 1 zone um, uh, changes by 2 pi times an integer, then, um, then the, uh, the Berry phase Goes to the, goes to the Berry phase plus two pi an integer, or equivalently, the polarization goes to the polarization plus uh, e, um, uh, uh, given this uh, definition of the polarization. Okay, so um, so uh, so what we see is that this ambiguity of adding another electron onto the end um, uh, uh, is reflected in the. Um, the uh, the ambiguity of the Berry phase under a, uh, on a non simply connected um, uh, uh, loop um, uh, uh, due to a, a large gauge transformation. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah, thank you. And this should be two, uh, e times n. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I feel like I can measure. Well, no, you can measure the absolute value of the charge at the end. That's what you can measure. That's, I mean, assuming, assuming that's what you're thinking of measuring. So what's the difference? So can you explain? I'm just wondering, the difference between that and the T, 
I could think of, um, so, so um, if I change the polarization by one unit, by E, and I remove an electron from the end, that'll have the same end charge. So you would conclude that those are the same. All right. Now, now maybe a smarter way of measuring the polarization, though, would be to say, um, I'm going to start from a reference system where I know, say, the polarization is zero. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change, I'm going to, I'm going to smoothly um, change my system and ask myself, you know, and, 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 and when the polarization is zero, maybe the end charge is zero. I can sort of zero my end charge. And then I can, I, can, um, I can change my system and then measure what the end charge is after I did the change. Now that's a well, provided I, I make sure that I didn't add any extra electrons at the end um, in that process, then, then that should be a well-defined uh, thing. Okay? But what there what you're measuring is you're measuring the change in a polarization rather than the polarization by itself. And so, so that is something which is uh, perfectly well-defined. <laughs> Wait, are you saying charge at the end is not just polarization got into an add? You can also add additional charges. Yeah, why not? You can add, yeah. I would have thought that is. No, so, so here's the thing. So the, to, to what extent is the charge at the end determined by a property of the bulk? Okay? And my contention is that it's only, only the fractional part of the, of the charge at the end is determined by the bulk. Because I can always just add electrons to the end. Okay? And so, so um, now, if you want to define P to be Q end, you can do that, but then it's not a property of the bulk. Because if I add an electron at the end, then you'd say you have to change P. So I'm trying to define something which I will call a polarization, which is a property of the bulk, okay? Which is something that conceivably maybe you could try to compute uh, uh, in, in, in a band theory, okay? Which is really, it's a property of, a, of the bulk. And, and there what I'm saying is only the fractional part of that that's, that, that's well defined, okay? So, so but... Um, uh, uh, changes in P uh, are well defined. And so let me just uh, explain that. Okay, so, um, so what I want to imagine now is that I uh, I have I, I introduce a new parameter in my system. So let's imagine that I have my my uh, my my state. Um, I want to introduce a new parameter u of k and and lambda. And I can imagine I can think that lambda maybe is like a function of time. It, it could be some some knob that I'm turning. Okay. And so um, so I. Uh, uh, so I can define the change in the polarization, which is P um, at uh, lambda equals 1, say, minus P at lambda equals 0. Okay? And so let's think of, about what that would be. Well, so, so if, I, if I draw this picture now, so now I'm going to draw a picture of lambda and K, and K goes between minus pi over A and pi over A. And, and lambda goes from zero to one, and so um, so if I want to compute this uh, change in the polarization, then what I do is I compute the uh, the uh, the Berry phase on this loop, and then subtract the Berry phase on this loop. Okay, and so now so, so now of course you have to remember that uh, that this is um, that 
plus k and minus k are the plus pi and minus pi are the same. So this is really now like a cylinder, okay, with a top edge and a bottom edge, okay. But now the blue, the now the um, the loop on which I am evaluating the Berry phase is the boundary of an interior. It's the boundary of of this, okay. And so so I can write this. Um, uh, so if I if I call this 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 whole loop C, then I can write P delta P is equal to uh, over this over this total total loop, which is the combination of these two, and that I can write as um, an integral over the uh, over the uh, Over the interior of this loop of 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 um, of the curl of A, basically. So I can use Stokes' theorem um, to uh, to evaluate that. So then this is completely uh, gauge invariant. Okay, and so um, so I can use this uh, this Berry phase formulation of the of the uh, polarization, if you will, to um, to uh, to compute this uh, to, to, to to compute the change in the polarization, and there everything is well defined. Um, yeah. Okay. So so remind me, Joe, which which what's the what's the time? Three, forty-five. Okay, good. Okay. Oh, but the yellow one isn't imaginary, right? Because this line is the same as this line. It's a circle. No, no, no. The, the two the two yellow lines they aren't lines. So this is really, if I was to, if I I could maybe I could draw it like this, right? Um, you know, the the yellow line is the two yellow lines are just this at at, at pi, right? So there there's there. You know, so there's no, there's nothing that, you know, that's just an artifact that it's hard to draw it on the chalkboard, okay? Um, but the important point, though, is that um, uh, if I do a, a large gauge transformation on this one, I'm forced to also do it on this one, okay? Because if I didn't, then there would have to be um, some singular point in the middle where there was a, so that would not be, that would not be spent. Okay, yeah, so that's, so, yeah. Continuous, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, so, <coughs> all right. So now let me give you one more um, Argument in face in 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 uh, uh, to support this uh, uh, proposition here, okay? Which is, what if you actually were going to try to, you know, uh, compute the polarization? What might you do? So, so you know, if you had a uh, Really, you know, a bunch of polar atoms, you know, that 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 you know that were they weren't talking to each other, that just form a you know inert insulator. Then what you do is you just say, well, I'm going to calculate the polarization by just evaluating the dipole moment on each atom, right? And that's you know that's a situation where I know which atom, which electron lives with, with each atom. So so you might think that what you should really try to do. Is uh, compute some sort of you know uh, some sort of e times some expectation value of r, all right? That that's what you're that, that's what you'd like to do, okay? Because r expectation this this is like the uh, the 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 um, you know the dipole moment, okay? The problem, of course, is is that the states you know the block states that you're evaluating this they're extended across the entire system, and so this thing you know and 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 they're defined for periodic boundary conditions. So this isn't this doesn't make sense. Okay, so um, 
But it would make sense if you could evaluate it in um, uh, a state that is localized. Okay, and so um, so uh, uh, so this requires localized state. Okay, and so um, so what one can do is one can define a basis of states for my states in the in the um, in the energy band, which are localized, and these are called one-air states. Okay, and um, so uh, so the one a states are um, are defined for any lattice vector R, and I can write. Uh, let me. Okay, so um, so this r hat. This is, I just mean this is the position operator. So 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 little r is an operator on the Hilbert space, whereas capital R is just a, a lattice vector. Okay, and so um, so so it's essentially what you're doing here is you know I have my block states which are defined um, for every value of k, um, and they're defined. Smoothly, I can I can try to define them smoothly, and this is essentially taking the Fourier transform of that. Okay, and so provided U K is smooth, then when I Fourier transform, it'll be it'll be something which um, which uh, uh, is reasonably short ranged. Okay, um, and so um, so uh, uh, so this then. Um, if I have my lattice vectors, so so uh, so these are my lattice sites, and then you know uh, so this uh, this one a state will be some you know uh, uh, you know reasonably localized uh, wave function. Okay. Now, um, the problem with Wannier states is that um, uh, they depend on the choice of gauge that I uh, used for you. Okay. So they're not really uniquely defined. Okay. But provided I choose a gauge which is smooth, then they will be um, they will be localized. And it makes sense then to um, to evaluate a dipole moment in this state. Okay, and so um, so the point I want to emphasize is that these are gauge dependent. But localized. Okay. And so, um, <coughs> yes, am I putting? Mod for mod this is a this is a oh yeah yeah no what 
No, no, no. Even, I mean, the whole thing depends on the gauge, even the, even the modulus of it. Okay. So, yeah. Um, if I do a gauge transformation, then this could look complete. Yes. Okay. All right. When I mean gauge, I'm referring to the gauge transformation on U of K. So then I'm for so if I do a gauge transformation, then I'm Fourier transforming a different function. I could do is you know I could do a gauge transformation which is nice and smooth. Okay, and so so then it'll still be it'll be localized. Now maybe yeah I guess maybe I should say that I'm, this is the modulus. Okay, and and um, uh, but uh, it it won't be the same. In fact, it may even be located somewhere else. Okay. So, um, but given this, given this choice of a gauge, I can evaluate my polarization now as just, uh, you know, um, what is the, you know, the, um, the sort of center of mass of my wave function relative to its home base. Okay, and I think one's guaranteed that this will be the same no matter which uh, R you, you use. Okay, um, and so if you then take this and uh, plug this definition into here, then I can write my polarization in terms of the block states, and um, and if you plug it in, it you know it takes a little bit of a line or two of algebra, but basically what this uh, what gives you is it gives you um, Gives you this, okay? Okay. Yes. Is it equivalent by saying that R in momentum space is basically minus I three? Yeah, except this isn't well defined, and this isn't well defined either. <laughs> So, so that's that. You could give that to argument to somebody who you're sure isn't going to uh, ask you further questions. Yeah, exactly. But let, so let me pose you a question here. So, so, so I told you that that this is you know this I, I explained to you um, is only defined up to an integer, whereas it looks like this is completely well defined. So where's the where where did the ambiguity go? Exactly. So here's the thing. If I do a large gauge transformation on, on U, then that is equivalent to changing, you know, I, I, have this, I have this localized state, which I've said was associated with this lattice site. I could do a large gauge transformation and say that this same localized state isn't associated with this lattice site, it's associated with this lattice site. Okay? And so, um, so, so it's the... It's the ambiguity of the um, of the Wadier states that um, that's where that's where the ambiguity of the polarization sits. Okay. Okay. Any any questions? Okay. I have fifteen minutes. Um, so uh, um, uh, what I want to do next is um, I want to introduce sort of the simplest model system. In which in which one can see this uh, at work, okay, and and um, and this will be um, this will be where the two level system uh, uh, with the you know uh, uh, fits into this uh, story, okay. So um, and so this model system uh, is called the Sushri for Heger model.
they have similar properties. This is what you meant by a derivation. Yeah, this is a derivation. I mean, one has to, um, you know. You kind of do the intuitive thing. You say. I, yeah. I, I Look, and and one has to be for the derivation. You have to be. You have to be. Um, you have to. If you, it depends what you mean by derive. You know. Uh, you know. One has to worry about how localized these are and how you know. So so one could. One could worry about things with this with this derivation, even though I think in, in essence it's correct. Okay, um, so I'll, I'll just say this actually is not the original um, uh, uh, derivation of of this. There's there's another deriv. When I get to the um, probably tomorrow, I'll talk about the Thales pump, and so Thales did. Um, uh, basically used a different der derivation, which was basically what he did was to, um, uh, again, imagine that I'm changing. Let's see, do I have that still? Oh, I erased it. So, um, so when I talk about the change in the polarization by tuning some parameter, what you can do is you can say, as I'm tuning the parameter, then the polarization is changing, so there's actually a current flowing. Okay, and so you can compute that current using linear response theory. Okay, um, you know, and using basically the Kubo formula. And if you integrate that current, then that that also that's another m sort of more rigorous derivation of this of this kind of thing. Okay, so that takes some algebra too. So I didn't I didn't I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that algebra for you. But yeah. is there a similar thing true for polarization in 2D and 3D that it's only just that it behaves like a bigger phase. Yeah. Well, there, you know, of course, the polarization defines the, you know, two dimensions. It defines the charge per unit length along the edge. So that's the edge charge. And, and there, it's the, um, the charge. So that's uh, ambiguous um, up to having, you know, adding an electron per unit cell along the edge. Okay. And so that's the ambiguity there. So it's like adding a filled one-dimensional band at the edge, which would give me one electron per unit cell. OK. OK. So let me introduce the Sushri for Heger model. I'm not sure I'm going to finish it uh, this afternoon. But uh... OK. So, um, so this is a model that was introduced in the 1980s as a model for um, a conducting polymer called polyacetylene. Okay, and uh, polyacetylene is basically it's a chain of carbon atoms um, with some hydrogen atoms attached to it, so that there's basically um, uh, uh, it, it forms a one-dimensional half-filled um, uh, chain. Okay, and um, but in addition to being a model for uh, polyacetylene, it actually is a very nice uh, model system to understand this topological uh, uh, phenomena. So, so basically what it is, um, is uh, it's a one-dimensional tight binding model. I'm just going to write it down for spinless electrons, even though in real polyacetylene, of course, you'd have up and down spins. Okay, so let's see where I do this. Okay. Okay. So um so uh so in doing this I've 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 made a couple of choices. I've defined a unit cell that has an A sublattice and a B sublattice. So this is my unit cell, okay? And and uh, I'll, my lattice constant, call that A, okay? And um, and then I have uh, I have you know uh, T1 and T2 hopping between there, 
Okay, and so um, so for T one equals to T two, then it's just a half filled band. So it's a um, it's a one D metal. And so if I just do the simple uh, band structure, so so when T one is equal to T two, then then you really just have you know every side is the same as every other. And so I can imagine drawing an energy band that uh, looks like uh, this. I could, I, could, I could draw a smaller unit cell with, um, with, uh, whose size is A over 2. So this goes from, from uh, you know, 2 pi over A minus 2 pi over A. But, um, but what it's useful to do is to define this larger unit cell, which allows me to have T1 not equal to T2. And then I have to fold, I fold back, and it looks like that. Okay, and so, so now this is my bro one zone. Like that. Okay, and, but of course, if T1 is equal to T2, then, uh, then there's no gap here. Okay, and it's, uh, it's kind of like the, um, like the, uh, empty lattice approximation for the near, nearly free electron gets. Okay, so I haven't turned on any periodic potential yet. But when I make uh, T1 not equal to T2, then I open a gap. In particular, I could have T1 bigger than T2, in which case these bonds are strong and these bonds are weak. Or I could have uh, uh, T1 less than T2. In which case, it's the other way around. In either case, um, uh, what will happen is we have a we uh, open up a um, open up a gap, like that. Okay, and so the point that I want to make is that. There is a sense, and I have to, we have to be careful about what sense this is. There's a sense in which these two are topologically distinct insulating phases. Okay, and um, and so so um, so so what I want to work towards is I want to work towards figuring out what the polarization uh, is. In this case, in, in in these two cases, okay. And I think I have, I think I can do that in the last few minutes. So, so let me uh, let me do that, and that'll be, then I'll finish. So, in order to figure out the polarization, we need to uh, figure out what the block Hamiltonian is. And so, um, so it's not too hard. Actually, I can do it. I can do it here. It's not too hard to Fourier transform this, and so then you get uh, Hamiltonian, which is going to be it's going to be a sum on k, c k a dagger c k b, and then there's going to be two terms. There's going to be the t1 term and the t2 term. The t1 term um, I stay in the same unit cell, and so, uh, so that doesn't get any uh, factor associated with it. The t2 term I jump from uh, the I unit cell to the I plus 1, and so that's going to get a factor of T2 e to the I k a. Okay, and then plus the 
transformation conjugate. Okay, and so um, so I can write this as um, uh, you know uh, sum on K of some H two by two matrix H A B of K times C K A dagger C K B. Okay, where little a and b run over capital A and b. And so then um, what this matrix is going to be is it's simply going to be, um, uh, well, I can write it as d of k dot sigma. And um, so, so, uh, so this is like the sigma plus piece. And the, 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 uh, the Hermitian conjugate is going to be like the sigma minus piece. So the sigma x piece is going to be the real part of this, which is t1 plus t2. So, so dx is equal to uh, t1 plus t2 cosine ka. And dy is, I think, going to be minus the imaginary part of this. So it's going to be minus T2 sine Ka. And then, of course, dz of K is equal to 0. OK? And so, um, so now we can sort of, so, so, so if I want to compute the, um, the Berry phase, I, I want to compute the polarization, what I need to understand is the Berry phase. Um, uh, associated with the ground state of this Hamiltonian when I go around the Brillouin zone. Okay? And so what the ground state is going to be is it's going to be a spin pointing in the D direction. And so, um, so let's think about what that looks like. So, um, so let's, supp let's suppose that T1 is bigger than T2. And so, uh, so the D vector sweeps out a curve in the, X, in the DX, DY plane. And when T1 is bigger than T2, then you can see that dx is, o is always going to be positive. Right? The, this term is always going to beat this term. So it's going to look, it's going to look like this. Okay? And so, so if I think of a spin, it's going through a thing that goes like this. It doesn't sweep out any area. So the Berry phase is 0. Zero and so p is equal to zero, you know, mod e. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if um, if t one is less than t two, then um, then uh, when k a is equal to pi, then dx is going to be negative. Okay, and so it's going to look like this. Okay, so it's going to go around the origin. <coughs> and so now if I imagine following um, you know, the unit vector, it's going around by 2 pi. So it picks up my favorite minus sign. So the Berry phase is pi, which says that the polarization is E over 2. Okay, so um, so uh, so this actually um, uh, makes a lot of sense if you think um, in terms of uh, if you think in, in terms of these uh, cartoon pictures here. Okay, um, the um, uh, um, so imagine so so let's take the extreme limit where the smaller of t1 and t2 is actually equal to 0. Okay? So then basically you have an electron which is localized on this bond, an electron that's localized on this bond, an electron that's localized on this bond. Okay? And if I then switch to the other state where t1 is equal to 0, then what I've done is I've taken that electron and I've moved it over by 1 half of a unit cell. Okay? And if I move a Charge, the charge E by one half unit of cell, that changes the polarization by uh, E over 2. 
Okay, and so 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 it's actually easy to understand why these two states differ in their um, in their uh, uh, polarization in their polarization. Okay, and 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 so this is something that you can uh, you can see um, by uh, understanding the uh, very phase. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, let me just close with a couple of comments um, about this. Can you say again why it matters? Because um, if here, yeah. right? Because then the Berry phase. So if I think of um, if I think of what the solid angle that is swept out by d of k as I go around this, since it goes around the origin, it's it's going around like this. Okay, so it's sw it's it's sweeping out a solid angle which is half of the sphere, which is two pi, which then gives us a Berry phase of one half that, which is pi. Okay. Whereas in this case, instead of going around, it's just it's just going like this. Okay. So it's not. Yes, exactly. So both of these you have to. So so um, so there's a there's a um, so of course this is it's living on the equator of the sphere. In this case, you know, if I have a unit sphere that looks like this, it's going around. Whereas in this case, if I have the unisphere, it's it's going it's going you know it's going up, then it's coming back, and then it's you know, so, yeah yeah okay. Um, let me just uh, say so so one question. Okay, yeah, question. Yes. Um, well, but then I'm not sure what you mean by polarization <laughs> in that case, right? So there is some locality built into that notion, right? Um, so, uh, uh, so, so I think um, certainly you can imagine going from this picture to this picture by picking up an electron here and moving and moving it moving it over. Um, uh, you know, if 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 you're insisting on having the B sublattice live um, uh, somewhere else, then you have to uh, uh, refine what you mean by this polarization. Okay. So, but that leads me to a to a to a to a thing, which is that um, there's something kind of funny about this. Okay. And maybe some of you can recognize where the problem is. You know, look. Um, so 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 these two phases, they look the same. Right now, you know, I didn't need to draw them going up and down like this. I mean, I, I could have dread, drawn them just on the line. In which case, this phase and this phase, they look the same. So how could it be that one of them has a Berry phase of zero and the other one has a Berry phase of pi? Which one is which? Why could that be? What? The difference, in that, the difference in that polarization. Well, that's certainly true, but 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 who decided which one was pi and which one was zero? Well, the the, the the so the p is defined mod e, so so this one is definitely zero mod e, and this one is definitely e over two mod e. Good. Exactly, you got it. So, so remember, I made an arbitrary choice, which is I defined this to be my unit cell. Which means that if this is the strong bond, that's what I'm calling polarization zero. Okay, and this one then is the other one. So that's where, that's exactly the place where, um, where I decided that, uh, that, that this one is this one and this one is the other one. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so now, of course, now you might say that well, that's kind of a um, uh, uh, unsatisfying thing that I had to make this choice. Why couldn't I do it in a way where I didn't didn't break the translational symmetry in my choice of what the unit cell is? Okay. I could have I could have chosen a gauge in which um, uh, I put 
uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, I put, you know, e to the minus i k a over two on this one, and e to the plus i k a over two on this one, and that would that that doesn't break the symmetry of the sublattices. But what that does is that that creates another problem, which is that this block Hamiltonian then um, is not periodic mod two pi. Okay, and so we're stuck with one or the other. Okay, and I I chose to have a Hamiltonian which is periodic going around the Bro one zone. Okay, in general, um, the Hamiltonian only has to be periodic going around the Bro one zone up to some gauge transformation. Okay, um, but I chose it to be completely periodic. Okay, and then one more comment, then I'll let you go, which is that um, you know the sense we need to, and I, I'm going to pick up on this tomorrow which is to think about the sense in which these two are topologically distinct. Okay? So in other words, what's the sense in which, in which this Berry phase of 0 and pi are really sharply quantized? So notice something essential happened, had to happen here, which is that dz had to be equal to 0. Right? Because if, if, you know, once the d vector can tilt out of the plane, then there's no reason that that the Berry phase has to be either 0 or pi. OK, and so you could ask the question, well, why is that here? OK, why can't, why am I not allowed to add a perturbation in which uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I get a dz? OK, and so the answer to that is symmetry. OK, and so we need to, we need to actually go and think about symmetry in the schrieffer heger model. If we don't impose any symmetry, then you can have a dz, and there's no topological states in one dimension. Okay, and so we need to, uh, you know, uh, we can't be too quick to say that we have these two, topolo two one-dimensional topological phases. Okay, so there's, a, there's another ingredient of symmetry that needs to be uh, included in that discussion. Okay, so I'll pick up on, on, with this on uh, tomorrow. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yes? Is there a chemist's interpretation of those double lines and single lines? Here? You mean double bonds and single bonds? Yeah. yeah that's, what, that's what it is. Right, I don't know that's well, that's, I mean, this is the picture that the chemists draw. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. Yeah? I meant what you said about, so if I choose a unit cell, let's say, to be... If I chose this to be my unit cell. Right, so, so what would happen, let's say, you say T1 greater than T2, why would then not give you pi? Well, so then what I would have had is I would have had, um, I would have had T2 plus T1 e to the i k a. Okay. And then you work. Everything would have been switched. Yeah. Okay, I think we're finished. So we're going to stick around, we're going to have an introduction. We're going to go around the room and uh, have each one of you say a couple of words, uh, uh, whatever you like, whatever you think is important about you. It can be all the way from science to what kind of alcohol you like to drink or what do you like to do outside of uh, physics.